get on the phone right now, but maybe I just don't want to. <laughs> just kidding, leave a message. Taylor, hey, it's me, Trevor. I'm outside the concert, wondering where you're at. I think I'm in the right spot, and I think it's already started, and I was... Hello? Hello? Can't get on the phone right now, but maybe I just don't want to. <laughs> just kidding, leave a message. Hey, your voicemail cut me off. So what I was saying was I'm outside... Right now, but maybe I just don't want to. <laughs> just kidding, leave a message. Okay, I'll talk faster for whatever reason. Can't get on the phone right now, but maybe I just don't want to. <laughs> just kidding, leave a message. Funniest thing, keeps cutting me off. Can't get on the phone right now, but maybe I just don't want to. Hey, I'll talk really, really fast because for whatever reason your little voicemail message thingy keeps cutting me off. Maybe it's because you have a cheap phone. Yeah, I said it. Hey, look, look, I see the writing on the wall. I am here, you invited me, and I'm standing out here like some dork waiting for you, huh? I got stood up by a buddy. What is that about? This is so you. This is so high school all over again. You get some more important friends, and me, I'm left like some chump. You have bad breath. Has anyone in your life ever told you that? It stinks, and you will not have me, Mr. Trevor, to kick around anymore. Do you hear me? No more. Bro! Mailbox is full. Full of that. Hey, hey. I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, I tried to call you, but my phone's jacked up. Anyway, the reason I'm late is I ran into this guy who was selling his tickets. You're gonna love this, okay? Get this. Box seats, all you can eat, food, the best seats in the house. And the best part? My treat. I mean, think about it. You're my best buddy, right? I mean, what better way to say thank you than these? Hang on, I was expecting a call. Let's take just a minute. Oh, it's a message from you. And another one. And another one. Have you ever had that happen? <clears throat> you know, in life, frustrations can come about in life. We can have those situations where we get frustrated and then the next thing you know, we're acting in a way and then boom, we're kind of hitting the face and you're just like, I need to back out of here. <laughs> Somehow, how do I save face? And a lot of the times we can't save face with this crazy thing called anger. And anger is the most misunderstood and by the way, misapplied emotion of all the emotions we have as human beings. See, a lot of people think that anger is always a sin. It can be a sin, but it's not always a sin. Sometimes anger is the most appropriate response. It's, it's a capacity that's given to us by God. There are some things that you should get angry about. There are things that God does get angry about. And sometimes anger is the best evidence of love. Somebody hurts my wife, somebody hurts my kids, I'm going to be angry. The problem is not anger. The problem is, do we express it appropriately or inappropriately in our lives? And we can see in, in, in our lives today, where we've come in our culture today, we weigh very heavily on the inappropriately way that we express our anger. A lot of things get said because we're not loving with our words that we learned about several weeks ago. We're not, we're not putting this love into action that we've been learning about here that Christ teaches us and talks about. And so when we get angry over the reasons we're going to talk about today, then the anger comes out inappropriately. And then we start to judge whole groups of people. You know, we'll, we'll look at stuff, and then a riot will happen and all that other kind of stuff. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see this, and we'll look at it and say, well, see, that's all blacks do is riot. That's the only way they know how to respond. No. 
That is such a horrible, awful statement. And it comes out of anger, inappropriately expressed. Are there people that are, was that wrong? Yes. <laughs> you know, that was an inappropriate way of what happened. Is it okay to, you know, pick it and all that? Absolutely. And, you know, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, we, we generalize. We look at, well, you know, all cops are killers. No. Are there good cops and bad cops? Yes. Good people, good white people, black people, good red people, black. Yes. It's what we see is we see people expressing it inappropriately in so many different ways. I mean, today, today, believe it or not, today, people are terrified to say whether they are a Democrat or Republican. Wow. I don't really care what you are. I'm a Christian. You know, I answer to Christ. Do I have my likes and my dislikes of both parties? Absolutely. Do I know what I vote when it comes to that? Absolutely. But to have people to be terrified to say, I'm not even going to do this because why? Because anger is out there. It's inappropriately expressed. You know, when it comes to that, because we're not expressing it with love. And and it happens because when we grow up, nobody teaches us the proper way. I'm sorry, school does not teach you how to properly deal with your anger. When it comes to that aspect, I think there's some good things within schools that it tries and it attempts, but because it shuts off the teaching of God's word, you you know, it, it makes it very difficult for those that want to do that. When we grow up, nobody teaches. That's why we have what psychiatry calls, we are living in the age of rage. And just because you or I, or just because we don't turn into Mount Vesuvius, doesn't mean we don't have anger issues. Typically, there's two ways that we deal with anger. Typically, uh, and, and you either become a turtle or you become a skunk. <laughs> you know, you get angry or you just kind of pull yourself in a shell, you know, your arms, legs, and head within, and you deal with the anger in that way. Or you become a skunk. Man, you just spew it all over and it stinks and everybody knows it when it comes to that. Those are the two typical ways. And, 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 and both are wrong. Both are wrong. Let me give you some fun facts about anger that maybe you didn't know between men and women. For instance, the average woman loses her temper three times a week. How many, what do you think, how many times does the average male lose his temper in a week? Somebody just shout out a number that you think. 20. She's been around a lot of angry guys. (laughs) He's behaving. (laughs) Hang on, I got to write this date down. (laughs) George behaved. I knew that was coming. He went to Iron Shop for Desire. He's been convicted by the spirit of how to... Never mind. Six times guys lose their temper uh, on, on average a week. A woman gets more angry at people while men get more angry at things like machines and stuff like that. Single adults express anger twice as often as married adults. So if you're single, get married tomorrow. You'll be less angry. Men are far more physical in their anger than women. And I think we all know this one. You're more likely to express anger at home than anywhere else. So how do we express this anger? Because in in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter that that shows what love should look like each and every day, the kind of love we should be expressing in all of our relationships, it says, love does not get easily angered. It doesn't say love does not become angry. It says it doesn't get easily angered. So if, 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 if that's the case, then how do we use this love? What does love look like? And what should we be doing to make sure we are expressing the anger appropriately. If you're taking notes, I hope you are. God says that if you want to learn to tame your temper, first of all, you've got to resolve to manage it. You've got to resolve to manage it. And what I mean by that is we've got to quit saying, I can't control it. I just can't control it. And start realizing that, yeah, you can. Stop making excuses and realize that, hey, anger is a choice. Just like loving is a choice, being angry is a choice. People say, oh, you make me so angry. No, no. Nobody can make you mad without your permission. It's a choice. In fact, you have more control over your anger than you'd want to admit. Let me give you an example. I gave this example about three years ago. You know, you're, you're at home with like, I don't know, your loved one, your spouse, and there becomes a discussion, and the discussion gets a little heated. Voices go up with that, you know, and, and it's getting a little louder and stuff like that. Maybe some words are being said that shouldn't come out of our mouth because we're not loving with our words like we learned about. Your face is getting flush. We've all been there, you know, and all that other kind of stuff. And in the midst, you got this anger, and all of a sudden, on the door. 
and you turn it, hi, oh honey, it's for you. You just turned it a dime. One second, you're cussing out, and you're flinging and mad, and in the next second, you're, hi, it's for you, darling sweetheart, love of my life. You know, we turn, what happened? We can do that. We made a choice to stop because we don't want to, you know, maybe we're embarrassed, maybe we're ashamed that we're having an argument. We don't want people to know. And so we made a choice to stop that. And we do that all the time. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. Keeps means it's a choice. And what I mean by when I say you resolve to manage your anger, you're saying I'm going to take steps to make sure I can handle it before I'm angry. Because if you wait to the point that the words and they're being said, the volume's up and the face is flush, you've already lost the battle. So you, first of all, you resolve it. That means you decide in advance that you're going to make choices. You're going to make choices to work on before it happens. And one of the things you do, one of the things that will help you do this is the second thing I want to talk about is you remember the cost. You see, when we remember the cost of uncontrolled anger, then we're going to be more motivated to manage it. When you're less likely to get angry if you realize that there's a price tag to anger. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 22, a hot-tempered man gets into all kinds of trouble. <laughs> and we can go on and on and on about what all kinds of trouble is, right? I mean, let's have a little confession, because, you know, let's have a little group confession here, because confession's good for the soul. I'm not going to ask you to say that you've done this and that. I'm just going to ask for a showing of hands, okay, and, and that on these verses, I'm going to read and see if you would agree with these verses, okay? How many of you would agree from your own life that you found out what Proverbs says, that hot tempers cause arguments? Anybody? Amen? Can I get an amen? All right. How about this one? Anger causes mistakes. Anyway, hallelujah on that one. Hallelujah. On that. Okay. How about this one? People with hot tempers do foolish things. That's like an amen hallelujah, is it not? When it comes to that. I've heard it said that when you lose your temper, you lose 50% of your IQ. And I'm thinking, wow, I can't afford that. <laughs> yeah, I really, really can't afford to lose that much, you know. But it happens. You do stupid, embarrassing things when it comes to it. Proverbs 11.29 says, The fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing worthwhile left. You always lose when you lose your temper. You can lose your reputation, respect of others, maybe even your job, the love of your family. You can even lose your health. You know that statement? Oh, he or she is such a pain in the... You put whatever anatomy you want to put within there that you usually say when you say it, you know. But it's a 100% true statement. If we don't learn to deal with anger, to love in this and take these steps that we're talking about, and that, then you know what happens? We, we keep that here and we don't deal with it biblically the way that God tells us to deal with it, love the way that we're supposed to love, then guess what? We start to get sick. Physically, ulcers. You know, acid reflex, all this kind of stuff literally becomes the pain in the neck is a pain in the neck. I mean, you could run a marathon once a week. You can be having kale salads every day. And you can be eating healthy and just loving it. But if you're not dealing with anger right, you will be physically sick. So we need to remember the cost if we don't control our anger. And here's the third thing the Bible says, that we need to make sure we reflect before we react. Reflect before reacting. In other words, think before you speak. Or, I've heard it put this way, put your mind in gear before you put your mouth in gear. We read from Proverbs 29.11 from the NIV earlier. Uh, it, I want to read it again here. It says this in a different translation. A stupid man gives free reign to his anger. A, a wise man waits and lets it grow cool. See, one of the greatest anger management tools is delay. Don't respond to that email right away. Don't, when you see that Facebook post that just hacks you off, delay when it comes to that aspect on it. You know, th this statement, you know, that we just read this passage, this is the biblical basis for the term chill out. God says when you start to get angry, take a chill pill, chill out. Give your sign time to, to, to think and to reflect. And that because the longer you can hold your temper, the better it improves. 
delays the remedy. And, and I'm not talking about delaying for days, weeks, months, or years, because we learned two weeks ago when we talked about love, the scripture says, don't let the sun go down on your anger in that. Because if you, if you go 24 hours holding this in pent up anger, it turns to resentment. And resentment is never good. Anger can be, but resentment never is. So the Bible says reflect. And you say, well, great, Dave. While I'm delaying, what do I do during that delay? You understand. You try to understand. What is it that's actually making me angry? Because my anger isn't the issue, it's the underlying. What's making, and there's three things when we get angry, there's usually one of three things, maybe all three things together that are making us angry. Maybe we've been hurt. You're getting angry, I don't know if I gave a place for you to write this down or not, but you can. You know, you need to, when you're delaying, ask yourself, am I hurt? You know, whether it's emotionally or physically hurt. When you get wounded, the natural response is to get angry. If I'm out, you know, nailing a nail in the garage and I hit my thumb, it's not sympathy I have for my thumb. Oh, poor thumb, the throbbing pain that you have. <laughs> no, it's not sympathy. It's anger that comes out of me at that particular. What am I angry at? Me, because I hit my thumb, you know, and stuff like that. And it's not sympathy that comes out of my mouth, you know, when that aspect can happen sometimes. With, or maybe I get angry at the hammer and I respond wrong and I throw the hammer across the room and it hits something and it shatters. There's the cost of my anger, breaking something else. And I get more angry in that. So hurt can cause anger when it comes to it, but also frustration. Maybe you're frustrated. And frustration is when you get, you know, irritated, when you get thwarted toward a goal. Maybe, maybe you've got someplace to go real quick and you run into a traffic jam and it's slowing you down to get there. And, and, that, and so you start to get frustrated and you find yourself getting more and more angry. Or maybe there's something that, you know, some whatever that you're involved in and people aren't as excited about it as you're excited about it. And you're getting frustrated. I don't understand, you know. Why aren't, why, why, why is everybody sleeping in this morning? Why aren't they here worshiping like we are? Having a good time? I don't understand and you can get frustrated and you get angry. Oh, they're with Pastor Pillow. I like him too. I'm going to go there next Sunday. You know, I mean, you can let that happen and that frustration can cause you to explode like a skunk on people in ways that's not loving and that, that we're talking about in that. Because, you know, basically what I'm talking about is things get out of control and you get frustrated because you can't control them. And what we need to step back and realize in this delay is most of life's out of my control. <laughs> You know, I, I can't control, you know, I didn't control where I was born. I didn't control who my parents and relatives are. I'm not going to control, you know, when I die. I mean, most of what makes me, me, makes you, you, is out of our control in that. So what are we frustrated about or what are we hurt about? Or the third thing is fear. Fear causes anger when we're threatened or trapped or feel attacked or afraid. Usually what's happening is we start to feel insecure and anger and insecurity always go together in that. And, and a lot of the times we have insecurity, what we're doing is, is because we're turning to people for our approval. We're turning and looking for people to uh, give us our approval and play the role of God within our life, to get our worth from people, to get our meaning from people, to get our purpose from people when that's supposed to come from God. And so every time we look to somebody else to get that, we get insecure and we get frustrated and we, we, we get hurt. And we, we feel fearful and that, and we get angry. So hurt, frustration, and insecurity. And it's important. That's what you do during the delay. But also to realize, you know, when somebody, when somebody gets angry at you, what's your response back? My first response is to get defensive. When you're attacking me in anger, I'm going to get right back and I'm going to get defensive because I'm not going to allow you to hurt me. But if you come to me and say, Dave, you know, what you said or what you did hurt me. Okay, it's a lot easier for me to deal with hurt than it is to deal with that anger lashing out when it comes to that. And when you're stepping back and taking this delay, here's a great, great thing to pray. Here's a great scripture for you to memorize. I'm always encouraging you to memorize it, you know, and telling you how good it is, putting God's word on your heart. Here you go, the 141st Psalms, verse 3, Lord Help me control my tongue. Help me to be careful about what I say. When you're back in that delay, Lord, help me to control my tongue as I deal with this anger. Help me to control what I say, you know, as I find out why I'm angry. And then what we need to do is the fourth thing. We have to release our anger appropriately. Because like I said, there are appropriate ways and inappropriate ways. There are helpful ways and harmful ways when it comes to dealing with the anger within our life. And if anger, if all anger was a sin, then God is a God that sins. 
Because God gets angry. God is angry over uh, rapes. God gets angry over child abuse. God gets angry over poor people being neglected, over racial prejudice, over and on and on. That angers God. So anger's not a sin, but we have to learn to release it appropriately because you see, Ephesians 4.26 reminds us, if you become angry, don't let your anger lead you into sin. It can lead us into sin, but it also is saying in that passage that there are times that it won't if we, you know, become angry don't let it lead us that means we there are ways that we can or it cannot lead us into sin you know but most of us unfortunately we fall into that that area where we, we let it lead us further away today in, in psychology and again i'm not against psychiatry i'm not against psychology in that but there's there's one thing in psychology that it teaches that's just so wrong and that it, it teaches there's this new teaching in psychology that everybody has this thing called a bucket of anger Maybe you studied this and heard this. You all have a bucket of anger. And the best thing to help you deal with your anger is you just got to empty that bucket, you know. And, and, and there's a new, well, it's not new, but the, the, one of the ways that they get rid of that anger is, is just to, it, it's called the primal scream. Just start screaming like a kid. Just scream in rage and just let it out and let it out and let it out and dump it till it's all out. And then all your anger will be empty. You'll have, a, you know, an empty bucket and you'll be able to deal with life. I can understand that philosophy why it's taught. It's just wrong. Because we don't have a bucket of anger. We have a factory of anger. And what I mean by that is, in our hearts, you know, it can produce plenty more anger <laughs> where that stuff came from in the bucket. And study after study, and research after research has shown that aggression only produces, guess what? More aggression, absolutely. Anger only produces more anger. So flying off of the handle makes you more likely to do it the next time. But the Bible tells us this in Psalms 15.1. A gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. And we all notice this, or we all know this. I mean, think about this. You ever been in an argument with somebody and you raise your voice? What happens to their voice? Yeah, theirs will get a little bit louder. So what do you do with yours? A little bit louder now, a little bit louder now. Oh, that's the wrong song. You know, but that's, that's what happens. It keeps going up and it keeps going up. And, and the Bible says, no, not loud and fast, low and slow. And I'll confess, this is an area I struggle with. You know, if you come to our house and you hear me and my boys, I've talked about this before, we go loud and fast at the drop of a hat. Now, recently, Tyler's gotten a lot better. And so... <laughs> We've gotten a lot better at this and stuff and that as we've been looking, as we've been learning, as we've been turning to God and stuff, you know, that go low and slow. Go low and slow with that because a gentle answer turns away wrath. So what's the best way to deal with anger? I want to give you three quick things that are wrong in the way that God says that is right. First of all, don't suppress it. Don't hold it in. Don't become that turtle and just bottle it all up inside. It's kind of like if you take a pop bottle and shake it up and let it out, that pressure. Yeah, suppressing it's not good. Don't do that. And, and don't repress it. Repression means denying. It means, you know, well, I'm not angry. Oh, that doesn't work either. <laughs> There's a word for repressed anger. It's called depression, okay? It's one of the greatest reasons for depression. It's not the only reason why people are depressed, but it's one of the greatest reasons because they have this repressed anger within them. So don't suppress it, don't repress it, and don't express it. <laughs> because the ways that we learn to express it have been wrong. And the ways we express it are wrong. I mean, some of you, you express your anger with sarcasm. And some of you are black belts in sarcasm. When somebody comes at you and you get, get you mad, your tongue comes to this knife and it's like, whoo, whoo. you just cut them apart with your words, your sarcastic words. You just cut them down to nothing and you're good at it. Others of you, you're not sarcastic so much, but you are great at manipulation. And your motto is, don't get mad. See, that, that's all of you right there. Don't get mad, no, you know, get even. You figure out a way to manipulate things so you can destroy or hurt the other person who has hurt you. And some of you, you're just Mount Vesuvius. You know, it will just explode all the time. None of these are appropriate. So you don't suppress it. You don't repress it. You don't express it. God says this is what you do with your anger. You confess it. You confess your anger. You talk to God about it. You turn to God about it. You know, and you confess to God the anger and the cause. God, I'm hurt. 
this person hurt me in what they did or said. Or God, I'm frustrated by this or by that. You know, or, or God, I'm afraid. This is why I'm angry. And you come and you confess it and you turn it to God. That's how you deal effectively with anger in your life. You confess it to God. And then the fifth thing, if you want to continue on and making sure you handle your anger appropriately, you have to repattern your mind. You and I have to learn how to repattern our mind. The Bible, we've talked about this before. The Bible teaches this, you know. You didn't learn to be angry and learn how to uh, express your anger inappropriately overnight. It was modeled for you. It was taught to you and everything. And that's how you learned how to respond, you know, when you find those situations. But the good news is that means you can unlearn it and relearn the right way. That's why the Bible tells us in Romans 12 too. Remember this verse? Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. What are the behavior and customs of the world? To repress, express, and suppress your anger. You know, no. The Bible says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. That's the way to learning a new way to handle your anger. Because when you act in anger, or when you act in angry ways, it's because you feel angry. And you feel angry because you're choosing in your mind to think it over and over. We talked about this four weeks ago. You know, repeating it over and over and thinking angry in your mind. And the way I think affects the way that I feel. So the Bible says be changed by the transforming and by the renewing of your mind. That's what God does. He's the one that changes those thought patterns in your mind. And you have to also understand this. Only you can change your thought patterns. Your own thought patterns. Not anybody else's. It has to be your choice. You know, in a relationship, you can love others the way that we've learned to love. You can speak the truth to them in love, but it has to be their choice to want the change. Only you can. So if you're in a relationship and there's this person acting wrong or you're always in these arguments and the volumes are always going up and loud and quick and all those other kinds of things and, and not low and slow and, and, and all that other aspect, you make the choice. You make the choice of what it's going to be like and you choose. And then when you're there, they're going to go, wait a second. As they're going loud and quick, real loud, and you're just staying low and slow, what's going on? Why, usually when I go loud, they, they match me. Usually when I get there fast so we can get this over with, they're there. There's, what's going on? And you change you. And in the process of you changing how you deal with anger, then that opens the door for them to also be able to change in their life too, in the way that they respond. It's their choice in that. But you say, Dave, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't learn good patterns of anger management growing up. I know. None of us did. You know? So how do you do it? It's the last thing I want to share. You got to reply, or excuse me, you got to rely on God's help. It's not going to be solved by a quick visit to Dr. Phil tomorrow when you flip on the TV, you know, or, or a magazine article or a seminar. Those things have their place. And I believe you can read things. And I believe there can be things that can be out there to help you. But Romans 15, 5 says, Patience and encouragement come from God. I pray God will help you to agree with each other the way Christ Jesus wants. There's that word patience we talked about last week. You know, patience is what's going to help us. You know, help agree with each other. Help deal with each other. Help work with each other the way that Christ wants. And how do we know what Christ wants? we look to the model of Christ like we talked about at the very beginning of this series. And we get to know that. You see, the closer you are in your walk, in your life, in your relationship with Christ, the easier it is going to be for your mind to be changed, your thought to be changed, and for you to deal with anger. If you're teetering, you know, eh, so-so, I'll be whatever, and that you're going to be teetering, you're going to be struggling with this anger. If God, you know, if Christ isn't even in your relationship, you're going to be struggling with anger problems all the time when life shows up in you. You're going to have problems being patient in life. See, uh, we're not talking about, and we haven't been talking about through this series, some kind of superficial love. We're talking about a supernatural love. And, and the scripture says when we give our life to Christ, when we turn to him, you know, that we have the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is patience and love and joy and peace. And that's how God helps us, you know. But the truth of the matter is this. People say, well, Dave, I don't know how God helps me with my bad habit of anger. He goes straight to the heart of the problem. And you know what the heart of the problem is? Of everything we've talked about here today, wrap it up this way. The heart of the problem is the heart. 
it's our heart that's there. It's not my behavior. It doesn't start with my behavior. It doesn't start with my background. It doesn't start with my attitude, my feelings, our emotions. It starts with my heart. The scripture says this, whatever is in your heart determines what you will say. The problem's not my tongue, it's my heart. My mouth just betrays what's inside of me. Bless you. So if you find somebody with a harsh tongue, a cutting tongue, they've got an angry heart. Somebody with a negative tongue, they've got a fearful heart. Somebody with a boasting tongue, they've got an insecure heart. Somebody with a judgmental tongue, always judging everybody, they have a guilty heart. Somebody with a, a critical tongue, and that, you know, they're always being critical about everything, they have a bitter heart. Somebody with a filthy tongue, they have an impure heart. But on the other hand, you find that person that in love, speaks to you, that person that has joy that's coming out, that person that speaks in a kind, gentle, patient way, guess what is in their heart? Love. They have a loving heart. And it all begins with the heart. So maybe, maybe the greatest thing to help us deal and, and be loving the way that we need to love, maybe the greatest thing that we need to do is stop and, and take a look and maybe the, the, the most powerful prayer that we could pray today is, is the prayer that King David prayed in, in the 51st Psalm when he turned to the Lord and he cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. Maybe that's what we need. I definitely think it's what our culture needs is a new heart to understand how to truly, honestly love people the way that Christ has loved. And we're not going to be able to love people the way Christ loved if we don't have that new heart. And the only way we get that new heart is if we have Christ come into our life. I've heard, you know, Lauren talk about it when he was talking up here and that about why we give and about communion, about what he's done for us. And that's what we've been learning, and that's, that's what life is about, understanding. The worship team is going to come out, and we're going to continue to sing, and, and, and we're going to spend some time in prayer, as we always do, and ask the Holy Spirit to take a look at our life. You know, do, how are we responding? Life shows up, like George says. You know, George gave that testimony. Life shows up, and when life shows up and you get mad and you get angry, how do you respond? You know, is it with the right heart? The words that come out, what kind of testimony are they giving about what's in your heart? Maybe today, maybe today, you need to say, Lord, I need you to give me a clean heart. I want to bring you into my life, to renew my life, and, that, and give me that clean heart. I don't know what that is, but we're going to spend some time in prayer, and then we're going to sing. And, and if you want the family of God praying because you know you're struggling with anger and not being able to love because you know you need that clean heart, you need that great physician to come in and give you a heart transplant, I don't know what it is you need. I'll be up front up here. Come on up. We, and if there's people with me, keep coming. We have leadership here that love you and want to be there and want to help us because we want to be about doing life together, loving together, holding each other accountable, spurring one another on as we've heard today so we can be that light and be that love. Let's go before God. Lord, I thank you so much again for this time that we could be in your presence and be reminded about the passionate love that you have for us and what that means and the love that your son Jesus Christ modeled for us. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you've given us these examples that we could be reminded of, Lord. I thank you that we could take a look and see, okay, this is, this is how you've loved. Are we doing that? Do we have the right heart? When life shows up, are we really being prepared for it? Are we really being prepared to love people the way that you have asked us to love? If not, Heavenly Father, then I pray for your wisdom and understanding for us to take some time and step back and see why. I pray for your Holy Spirit to search out our lives and see those areas where maybe we have just taken the wrong direction and maybe where we need to get back on path, the steps that we need to take to put our life back on path. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for the demonstration of the greatest love ever when you sent your son to die on the cross for us when we didn't deserve it. I pray that that never, ever leaves our hearts, Lord, that we remember that each and every day, Lord, and that we don't deserve it, but Father God, you love us. May that be the kind of love that we leave from here, that we understand, that we try to live each and every day, Father. Thanks that we could come and remember that. Thanks that we could come and, and celebrate that. Thank you, Father God, for this time being in your presence. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing.